Hey everyone, welcome to The Pursuit with James Griffin. Today we're talking about the cost of discipleship and what that means for us today. Hey everyone, welcome to The Pursuit with James Griffin. My name is Mike Anthony, and I am the discipleship pastor here at Cross Point City Church. And I am here with our lead pastor, James Griffin. Uh, and James, you are just now coming back from a pretty long sabbatical. Like, how how does it yeah. feel to be back into the into the mix? Yeah, uh, I feel like I'm still trying to get all the way back. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> trying to settle in and, yeah. and get back into my normal rhythms, but. Man, it's crazy. About halfway through sabbatical, I was itching to get yeah. back. And so it was good. We we went away for a couple more weeks in July, which helped, but yeah. super grateful to be back in the house, man. Well, for anybody that is kind of, you know, new to Cross Point City yeah. or has been living under a rock for the last eight weeks. Yeah. Uh, you know, you celebrated ten years right. at Cross Point City this year. Yep. And in light of that, in you know, kind of in addition to your normal sabbatical time. Uh, the church elders had afforded you eight weeks yeah. to go yeah. on sabbatical. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you were you were gone for an extended period of time. You were itching to get back. Um, let's let's tackle some questions real quick right okay. out of the gate. All right, sabbatical questions. Because people had some questions. All right. about your sabbatical. Let's go. All right. So the first one. How many different kinds of fish did you catch on your sabbatical? <laughs> Listen, I love that question, and I imagine that whoever asked it is actually a fisherman because Probably. only fishermen would know that <laughs> I kept track of how many kinds of fish. I actually did. Yeah. Keep, I didn't like tally up every fish I caught, so I yeah. don't know a total number. Uh, but I actually caught 11 different species of fish while I was away. So I, I fished okay. rivers, lakes... Uh, ocean, the whole deal. So 11 different species of fish. Which one were you most excited about? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, which one I was most excited about and it quickly let me down, okay? <laughs> so I, I've got two answers. So uh, I was on an offshore fishing trip with yeah. a buddy on vacation and I hooked into this massive cobia, all right? Okay, I don't even know what that is. It, it's just a giant saltwater <laughs> fish. fish. Yeah, they get really big. So hooked into this giant <laughs> cobia, I fought this fish for about 30 minutes. Yeah. We're chasing it. You know, the captain of the boat, he's he's trying to, because the fish is just pulling drag like crazy. And so we floated about 700 yards off the reef we were fishing. And okay. so the captain's like, I think we're fine. No sharks out here. <laughs> Kept talking about how great of a fish Kobe is to eat. Like yeah. he's just talking it up, right? And so fought the fish for about 30 minutes. He finally comes to the surface. I'm gaining ground, almost have this fish to the boat. And then out of nowhere, this massive shark. Stop. Kid you not, comes along and demolishes my fish. <laughs> that uh, that hurt my feelings. I'm not gonna really? lie. It took me a little while to get over that one. So yeah, that was that was painful. But but it's a cool story. Cool story. I, I will say the one I was probably most excited about that I actually got to hold and take a picture of yeah. was this massive trout that I caught in North Georgia. I, I'm a novice trout fisherman. Yeah. And so to catch a fish of, of that size and quality by myself, <laughs> I was pretty proud of that. So it was fun. Yeah. All right. There was another one that came in. So we're on, we're kind of, people were really interested okay. in your fishing uh, I, I exploits. I like that. I like so that. So what was, what was like the coolest place you were able to go fishing? Like the one that you enjoyed the mm, most? That is a really good question. Um, I love saltwater fishing when I get the chance to do that. So fishing at the beach was always fun. Yeah. Uh, but I do, I, I mean, Blue Ridge was incredible, man. You know, we, we had a chance to stay at a cabin in Blue Ridge. A family from the church blessed us with it and they have a big stretch of private access to a stream there. And so nice. every morning I would just get up, girls were still in the bed <laughs> and I would wade the stream and catch all these trout. And so that was, it was awesome. I don't get to do that much. So really enjoy yeah. that. Yeah. Fish every night for dinner. That's right. Yeah. And I'll just say, if you're listening, man, and you have a stream or a pond <laughs> that uh, you need somebody to fish, you just hit me up. I'll be glad to come <laughs> take care of that for you. <laughs> all right. Last one. We're yeah. going to move on. What, uh, what was one of your favorite memories from you know, this time that you had in sabbatical? Yeah, uh, man, there were many. Um, you know, I, I have to say just a general answer. You know, the time I got to spend with my girls was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, vacation, getting away to the mountains, but, you know, just waking up and being there with my girls and spending really good quality time was great. Uh, it was encouraging. The morning I got up to finally come back to work, Yeah, 
and I'm getting dressed and my daughter Rowan, she's like, daddy, where are you going? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> so babe, I gotta go back to work. And yeah. she's like, no. <laughs> and so I'm just grateful that my girls are still at an age where they want me there. Yes. And uh, it's so a nice yeah, age. absolutely. Yeah. So I would just say in a general, in a general sense, just being with the family was great. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about just briefly, like what a pastoral sabbatical is, okay. right? So we've yeah. talked a lot about, you know, the fishing and you right. know the fun and vacation and all this kind of stuff. But you know, a, a pastor sabbatical isn't necessarily just you kind of sitting on the beach and going fishing for right. eight weeks, right? Yeah. So there, there's a little bit more to it. So yeah. help us understand. Um, yeah, I think we get the rest and the vacation and all that kind of stuff. But help yeah. us understand what what's that other component yeah. of why we do pastoral sabbaticals. Right. Yeah, well, I would say a huge part of it is spiritual rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike, you get this. I mean, yeah. we do ministry day in, day out. And, you know, man, living in this world, it is just so easy to get bogged down in ministry yeah. and your relationship with the Lord. If you're not careful, man, it, it can grow cold or it can mm -hmm. just become another thing that you do. And so these sabbatical seasons for guys like us really allow us to, to step away from what we do yeah. and to remember who we are in Christ, that we are loved sons of God, to really connect with him, not around uh, a job or the service yeah. of others, but, but to connect with him around our identity, the gospel, what Christ yeah. has done. And so I, I'll tell you, man, it was just so life-giving in that sense. Mm -hmm. I've been working on a master's degree for the past five and a half years now, <laughs> and I just finished in May. And so the timing was great because I actually got to read books over the summer that I wanted to read. Right. Not books that someone told me I had to read for a class, but books that I wanted to read. Yeah. And so just time in the word, time in prayer, time in nature, uh, reading the stuff that that you know I had stacked up to read when I was done with with school. Yeah. So life giving, man. And so uh, I really do feel like I came back rejuvenated. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I remember early on. When I was you know, getting into ministry vocationally, yeah, uh, and you know there were some men that were walking with me through that process, and you know that was one of the things they warned me about is you know it can be very easy because right. you're doing so many spiritual things that your personal walk and your personal relationships start getting put on the back burner because yeah. you're yeah. doing ministry all the time, so you don't really need right. to worry about that. Yeah. So uh, that's good, yeah. and I'm really glad that you had the opportunity to really kind of unplug. So you're back. Back. You're unplugged. Yep. You're recharged. You're refreshed. And you've kind of come back with this, with really the Lord impressing upon your heart this idea of total surrender. Right. Right. Yep. And this kind of this kind of leads us into the the, the message that we're about to talk about. But yeah. um, tell us a little bit about kind of how you got there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I always go into these sabbatical seasons or, you know, in, in between sabbaticals, we do these every five years. Mm -hmm. uh, I always take a preaching break in the summer. Um, we'll still stay engaged in what's happening in the life of the church, but I, I turn over preaching responsibilities for a short time yeah. just to do some other things. And I go into those seasons not really knowing uh, what the Lord is going to do in my life, but fully expecting that he's going to do something right. significant. And so, you know, I said it on Sunday. It's not like I'm coming back like Moses with my face glowing <laughs> off the mountain with these massive revelations. No, yeah. but truly, uh, while I was away, did a lot of reading, um, did a lot of podcast listening, studying scripture, mm -hmm. and just did my best to really listen yeah. um, for the Lord, you know? And and this theme of surrender just kept creeping up. It's like every time I listen to a podcast, every time I open the page of the book, mm -hmm. uh, every time I would spend time in the word, it was that. Yeah. And I think, Personally, the Lord was confronting me with that question. Okay, James, are you fully surrendered to the Lordship of Christ in every area of life? Yeah. Like Christ is Lord. It's not about making him Lord. He's Lord. So are you surrendered? <laughs> and then I truly believe that, as I said on Sunday, this next season of our church will be one in which God's going to call us to that yeah. corporately in a big, big way. And so no idea what it's going to look like, but I'm excited about the implications and uh, to get us into the text. Yeah, it's going to be costly. Yeah. Excited, maybe a little nervous. Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's jump in. So All you right. just preached uh, this past Sunday, Luke 14, 25 yep. through 35. Right. Um, all right, so and in this passage, Jesus is kind of laying out the cost of being a disciple or the cost yeah. of following Jesus. So... Real quick, can you kind of just give us the Cliff Notes version, and then we're going to dive into some questions that people yeah. have submitted. Yeah, for sure. Well, 
if I can, man, I'll just kind of plow through the text real quick and do the Cliff mm-hmm. Notes version. You know, what we see are, are these great crowds accompanying Jesus, all these people following Christ because of the things that he was doing at the time. And on this one occasion, he turns to this crowd and he says to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. And so what Christ is calling us to here yeah. is to treasure him over every other relationship in life, right? This is not literal hate. Right. Uh, Jesus would never teach anything that contradicts the scriptures, mm-hmm. but he is calling us to love him uh, so much so that all of these other relationships look like hate. Right. And so it has to be Christ over every rela- uh, relationship. And then he goes on and he says, whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me can't be my disciple, mm-hmm. which is a call to all out obedience, obedience no matter the cost. If it means persecution, rejection, uh, even us laying our life down for the sake of Christ, that is what we do to mm-hmm. remain faithful to him. And then you keep reading the text and he calls us to count the cost of that. Mm-hmm. Uses these illustrations about a guy building a structure, a king going out to war, and he makes the point, both of these guys are gonna sit down and count the cost of what that requires. And when it comes to following Jesus, yeah. we have to do the same. Uh, is the price worth it? Are we really willing to pay the cost of true discipleship? And we see the cost in, in uh, verse, let's see, let me find it, 33 where he says, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all can't be my disciple. So the cost is everything. Yeah, I said it on Sunday, all Jesus wants from you is everything. And so at the end of the day, we got to weigh that out and figure out if following Jesus is really worth that. Yeah. So let's just take a moment and let's admit and just kind of recognize that's hard. It's a huge ask. Right? So this is is not... I would say it's almost a foreign concept. Yeah. Yeah. And especially in the American church. For sure. Where it's just, hey, you know, pray the prayer, yep. come back next week, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Right. Yep. Or it's like our culture says that, um, you know, I want what you have, but I want it on my terms. Yeah. And, you know, we see this throughout scripture too. When people came to Jesus and said, what, do, what must I do to inherit right. eternal life? Yeah. He wanted it on his terms. He didn't want it on Jesus. And Jesus is saying in no uncertain terms, here's the terms. Yeah, that's right. Here's what you have to be willing to do. Yeah. Um, so with that, you know, why why do you why do we think that this idea that I want what you want, but I want it on my terms? Mm-hmm. Like Jesus, I want you, but I only want this part, or I only want to do these things. Why yeah. do you think we have such a hard time with that yeah. in our culture today? <laughs> Because we're sinners, man. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. But and I'll expound upon that. But but I do think at the very core, uh, because we are sinful people, broken people, mm-hmm. uh, people who want, like truly, and, and we see this it started in the garden with Adam and Eve. We want to be in authority yeah. over our own lives. And it's one of the great lies of the enemy that if you, if we will if we will call the shots if we will serve as gods if if we're in authority over life somehow we're going to we're going to make life work better than surrender to the lordship of Christ ever would make life work you know what i'm saying yeah. and so we we buy these false narratives that that tell us man we know best we know what leads to happiness this is what we hear in our culture all the time right yeah live your truth follow your heart just do you as if we're the people that have all the answers right and we're not. Uh, again, I, I said on Sunday, and I think this is so key, we have a very real enemy who wants to destroy us. Mm-hmm. And the way that he does that is through deception. He lies to us. Yeah. And he lies to us in hopes of getting us to indulge those disordered desires that live in us. Mm-hmm. And we all have them because we're all sinful people. Yeah. And then he's built this worldly system that has now normalized a lot of those desires and behaviors. So we'll look out there and go, oh, well, it's, it's fine. Everybody's doing it. So it's Must okay. be okay for yeah. me. And, and so I think as people, if we are not careful, we can easily be duped by the enemy, mm-hmm. uh, buy into the flesh, buy into what the world is selling. And yeah, we, we want what we can get from Jesus, but we don't want to do what's required to get it, which is all out surrender, right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. You have any additional thoughts on that? Well, I think I heard, I've heard it from several people, but I think the first person I heard it from was um, Jen Wilkin, okay. where she says, we, we have this almost innate desire 
for a God of our own making, mm -hmm. a God that we can understand, yeah. a God that will conform to us, mm -hmm. a God that will conform to our worldview, our, like we are the ones calling the shots. Yeah. But what we see in this passage, what we see all throughout scripture is that, that Jesus is saying, that's not the case. Yeah. Like, if you're gonna come to me, it's gonna on my terms, not yours. Yeah. Man, I don't know who said this, but I've actually quoted it and preached it. I'd have to go look it up to find the, I, don't give me credit because I didn't come up with it. <laughs> but, I, but I've heard it said before that in the beginning, God created man in his image and man has been creating God in his ever since. That's good. And I think there's so much truth in that. Yeah. And it's incredibly dangerous. It is. Yeah. All right. So next question then. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. I think right. so. Can a person then be a believer, but not... A disciple. Mm. Simple answer: No, <laughs> no. Uh, there's no distinction between a believer and a disciple. Um, Jesus did not simply ask people to make decisions; he called mm. people to discipleship. Yeah. And it's interesting. I'm actually we're going to get into the Gospel of John this week, and uh, I'm going to talk about this early on, and I'm going to wear our church out with this over the course <laughs> of the series. But buckle up, hey, buckle up. <laughs> you know, it's interesting in the Gospel of John, which he wrote for the very purpose of of helping us to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. This mm -hmm. was his purpose. The word belief in the Gospel is pistuo in the Greek, and it means to entrust. Yeah. And so, belief is not a concept in the New Testament. Uh, belief is not a noun in the New Testament. It is a verb. It is an action. Mm -hmm. Belief is something that we do. And at the end of the day, it is when you and I entrust our lives to Jesus Christ as God and King. Yeah. Another word we could use is surrender. Mm -hmm. And so can you believe without being a disciple? Well, the question contradicts itself. Yeah. Uh, how do I entrust my life to Jesus in full surrender and separate that from discipleship? You, mm -hmm. you can't. Yeah. Uh, believers are disciples and disciples are believers. And so uh, you can't separate the two. So I was thinking about this one also, and you know, as we're getting ready for, you know, cause we're writing groups curriculum around this stuff. And yeah. And studying the passage myself. It, it, it dawned on me who Jesus is talking to. Yeah. He's not, he's not talking to the disciples. Mm -hmm. He's talking to the crowd. Right, yeah. Like almost as if, hey, this is the price of admission. Yeah, yeah. So he's not calling he's not calling the disciples to be apostles and raising the bar for them. He's talking to the crowd and saying, "Hey, look, yep. there is no spiritual elite, right? And then regular believer, it's yeah. it's you're a believer or you're not. That's right. And you know that that's why we have to understand that there is no there's no difference. The terms yeah. are synonymous with each other. Yeah. We're talking about yeah. the same thing. Well, let me just add one other thought. I think that's why we have to be very careful in separating Christ as Savior from Christ is Lord, right? Yeah. Um, th there is no like, oh, do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, but not follow him as Lord? Like, th <laughs> it makes no sense. It's the half price sale. Right. It makes no <laughs> sense. Like, you know, again, I said it on Sunday, Christ did not come here 2,000 years ago and give his life for us to be used by us. Yeah. Right? And so it's not like, oh, Jesus is fire insurance, so now I can go live like hell and doesn't matter. Right. Um, no, 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 no. When we decide to follow Christ, to put our faith in him, we are literally entrusting ourselves to him. Yeah. That is biblical faith. We start with the knowledge of what is true. We agree that what we know to be true is actually true. And then we entrust our lives to him. Yeah. And so there is an element of surrender, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can't separate it out. All right. So it would be really easy yep. to read this passage um, and think, okay, I've got to work for okay. my salvation. And if I've got to work for it, then yeah. that also means that I could lose it right, if I'm not right. doing these things well yeah. enough. Uh, and you know, with that probably comes a lot of tension now because you know, I thought salvation was by yeah. grace through faith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, what advice would you offer to the person reading this that may be feeling like, mm -hmm. okay, I thought this one thing, but this passage sounds like it's telling me I got to work for my right. salvation. Yeah. No, I would say you're right. You don't work. Um, again, do, uh, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. It is not a result of work so that no one can boast. Mm -hmm. And so there is nothing we could ever do to earn or to merit or to deserve salvation. Yeah. In reality, apart from Christ, we're spiritually dead and dead people can't do anything. Right. And so without him, we are helpless and hopeless in every way. Um, works don't save. So you're, you're right on. 
what Jesus is calling us to here is is to respond to his work mm-hmm. in a very specific way. Yeah. Right? This is this is the gospel, man, that Christ came into the world and did for us what we could never do on our own. That he accomplished the work. Christ came and by his life, death and resurrection earned for us what we could never earn and he's put us back in right relationship with God, uh, rescued us out of sin, death, and hell. Praise God for that. Mm-hmm. And so in response to what he's done on our behalf, this is what he's asking. Yeah. Hey, I gave my all for you, and now I'm asking you to give your all for me. Mm-hmm. I surrendered my life for you. I'm asking you to surrender your life for me, uh, to me. And so, again, this is not a working for anything uh, this is our response to the work that Christ has accomplished. And, and I would even say this, you know, Christ sends his spirit to indwell us mm-hmm. so that we're empowered to actually do this. And so even living this out, it ain't all on us. Yeah, It's not like, oh my gosh, you know, I prayed the prayer and yeah, I know Christ and now I got to work really hard to do this. No, the way that you pull this off is by walking in daily surrender to the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. You yield yeah. your life to him. And the spirit of God empowers and enables you to follow Christ in this way. And so even the act of discipleship is something that that God uh, accomplishes for us, in us, and through us, which is, ooh, that that takes the pressure off, you know? (laughs) Yeah, breathe a little bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we got two more questions. Okay. Um, And these are gonna, we're gonna get a little bit more practical. Okay. Um, first, first of the last two, uh, what ways have you found that help you focus on putting God first in your life? So practically, what does it look like to put God first? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to kind of blow the question up if I can, because... You do whatever you want. All right. <laughs> All right. So I, I would say in response, God is not interested in being first. Mm-hmm. God is interested in being at the center of all. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a priority list, it's not like God's like, hey, put me at the top of it, that'd be great. No, God wants to consume your list. Mm-hmm. He wants to be Lord over all of life. And so it's not necessarily about you putting him first, it is you recognizing he's first. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, he, he is first. He is before all things, he is Lord and King. And in recognition of what is true about him, you surrender your life. Mm-hmm. Like you, you lay down whatever it is that you're holding on to in recognition that he's worthy and he deserves it all. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's how I would answer that question. I don't know if that helps the person who asks, but. Well, I think that you just kind of build on that. Yeah. I think that we can also, um, Psalms 139 comes to mind mm-hmm. where he says, search me and yeah. try me. Yeah. See if there be any evil way in me, yep. right? So incorporating that prayer into into your life on a regular basis to to honestly and earnestly seek the holy spirit to say lord mm-hmm. where am i putting other things first what yeah. idols exist in yeah. my life um and then asking for the courage to abandon it yeah, yeah. right um, let, let me say this as well man i, I think um i would encourage you ever ask it man preach the gospel to yourself every day mm-hmm and remind yourself of what Christ has accomplished on your behalf, because that's gonna stir your affections up for the Lord. Yeah. And the greater your affections, the more able and willing you are to surrender. So mm-hmm. I think that's key. But then I would also say, man, you gotta remember that true joy is found in surrender. Yeah, Like true true joy is not found in you holding on to different aspects of your life, right. as if you can do it better than Jesus can do it. Mm-hmm. If you really wanna know joy and life and contentment, then you give your all to him. Jesus is for your joy. Yeah, He's for your joy. And I, man, if, if we really believe that at our core, mm-hmm. I think we would be so much more willing just to release whatever it is we're holding on to. Yeah. I think at times we think, oh, Jesus just wants it, so I'm miserable. No, that's not the case, man. <laughs> It's not like yeah. he, he wants you to do life his way because he is for your joy. Mm-hmm. And so if you can believe that and hold on to that, that'll help. Well, it's like, it's like Adam and Eve in the garden. Yeah. Where Satan convinced them that they could, their life would be better in disobedience That's right. That's right. than it would be in obedience. Yeah, which kind of leads into this final question. Okay, where yeah, some, one person asked, "Where is a good place to start with surrender?" I know all, yeah. but can you give some examples? So, in terms of like areas of life, right? Yeah, I, I think that's what they're asking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Well, again, I would go back to what Christ said in the text, relationships. Mm -hmm. If there's any relationship you're placing above Christ, then you got to figure that out. Yeah. And for that relationship to work, you're going to have to love Christ more than that person, whoever it is. Mm -hmm. If it's a spouse, a child, somebody that you're dating, whatever. And so I think, yeah. you know, take a survey of those relationships and go, okay, is, uh, is Christ more important than this person? Yeah. And figure that out. You know, when I think about obedience, um, I, I think to categories like time, talent, and treasure. Mm -hmm. Am I using my time in the way that Christ would have me use my time? Yeah. In a way that would honor him, that would help me and other people with your talents. Man, are you serving anybody? Mm -hmm. who, who are you helping? Yeah. Who are you sharing the gospel with? Uh, that could be here inside the church. It can be outside the church, but are you doing anything to really build and advance the church of Jesus Christ? And then your treasure, man, like you don't own that. God gave you that. Mm -hmm. And God calls us to generosity. Uh, I think for a lot of people that, that may be one of the more difficult areas of life to surrender is the wallet. Yeah. You know, one of the books that I read this summer, the guy talked about the crusaders back in the day when they baptized the crusaders, they would hold their swords out of the water. Yeah. It's like, you can have all of me, but you can't have this, right? Because yeah. I'm going to go do some damage with this. And I think in the church today, especially where we live, a lot of people do that with their wallets. Yeah. Baptize me, hold my wallet. Like, hey, you can have all of me, you just can't have this. Pretty sure there's a meme about that. Yeah, probably yeah. so. So, uh, <laughs> so I would say, I mean, those are the first categories that come to mind. Yeah. And I would just remind you again, it's obedience no matter the cost. Mm -hmm. And so you, you might even be able to answer that question for you better than I could, whoever asked. Well, and I think, I think that's really where it, what it boils down to. Yeah. Um, you know, my question for the, the person that asked it would be, what do you feel like God's telling you to do right now? Right. Because if the answer is, I don't know, yeah. then I would say, okay, well, then you need to start spending more time focusing on your spiritual disciplines. Yeah. How much time yeah. you spend in the Word. Maybe you don't know how to obey Him because you don't know what He wants you to obey. Yeah. So let's start getting into the Word. That's good. Are you connected in community? Are you doing yeah. these things? Um but I would, I would be willing to wager a lot of the people asking a similar question, they have an idea already yeah. of what that is. It's that thing you it's don't want to do. It. It's that thing you don't want to do. That's the thing. Yes. Surrender there. <laughs> yeah. So I, I remember, so I'm going to channel uh, Bro T. We've talked about yeah. Bro Tim <laughs> yep. on, the, on the podcast before. Uh, and you know, he used to say, you know, if, if you're unsure of whether or not you're supposed to give that money, or you know, help that person on the street, or you know, whatever that thing is. Yep. Um, he said, "I can promise you, if it's going to help somebody else, it's not your flesh. Mm. That's the spirit, and you need to listen." That's good. So that's where I would start because yep. I mean that that idea of surrender it, it could be very different. Yeah. Depending on who's asking the question. Sure. So, if you know, if that's you and you're answering asking that question right now, my question to you would be. I think you already know. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about what that is. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, I think that is a good place to put a pin in it for right. this week. Next week, we are starting um, in John 1. Gospel of for, John. For the foreseeable future. Yeah. It's going to be yeah, awesome. We'll, we'll we're really see, excited we'll about it. We'll see how long it takes. Next week, we're going to tackle five verses. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so we'll get through good. it eventually. Um, so as... Uh, as you're listening to the sermons um, and as you are um, following along with the podcast, please submit your questions. It makes it, uh, it gives us more to talk about. And if you don't ask questions, then I'm going to make some up and I'm going to try <laughs> to stump James. So he'd probably appreciate you asking yeah, some questions. Um, but uh, until next week, yep. um, know that uh, we're here for you and we love you.